Powerledger is a, a technology company that operates in the energy sector. And we do a couple of things. One is enable peer-to-peer -peer trading of electricity. And that could be you know, my house trading electricity with your house, or it could be a large solar farm selling to many customers, so more of a B2C transaction. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a, a product that enables peer-to-peer -peer trading within buildings, like an apartment building. Yeah. And uh, another product which uses the blockchain to fractionalise ownership of renewable energy assets. So you might, um, if you built built like even a traditional energy asset, like a gas-fired power station or a solar farm or a community battery, you can uh, break down the ownership into very small increments. So somebody might be able to purchase 0.1% you know, of a solar farm and the blockchain would be the asset register and also the income register. So it would mean that anyone that had purchased 0.1% would also receive 0.1% of any income that that asset generated. Great. That sounds fascinating. So. I understand as well that Power Ledger has uh, issued Australia's first ever ICO. Yes. What can you tell us about that? Uh, well, uh, it's for those that don't know what an ICO is. Yeah, might a, need to explain that. Yep. It's um, an initial coin offering, and blockchain companies are creating a cryptocurrency for various purposes. Sometimes it's actually just a tradable like commodity. Other times it has a utility, and in our case, uh, our token, the Power Token is a, a license to transact peer-to-peer -peer on our platform. And so mm -hmm. we, we created a, a billion power tokens and sold 350 million or 35% of those uh, to the market right. uh, in September and October this year. And we raised 34 million Australian dollars. Wow, that's impressive. Um, fantastic. Um, so what, how do you see the role of blockchain, I guess, in the future of the renewable energies marketplace. Obviously, Power Ledger is a bit of a pioneer, I think, in 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 the space. Yeah, I mean, How, where do you see it going? Our mission is around the democratisation of power, and that our technology adds a level of sophistication to energy markets that you know are about as geared up to buy electricity back from me as a supermarket is to buy homegrown tomatoes, and so it allows that marketplace to transact with each other very efficiently. And uh, so what that means, at the moment, if you have surplus electricity from rooftop solar, you will receive that income uh, you know, every 60 days when you get your electricity bill. But using the blockchain, you could actually receive the payment the moment the electricity is spilled out onto the network and you, you consume it. And so it means that the payments could be much more uh, fast and that you don't need an inter intermediary to do the reconciliation between the buyer and seller. And so you, you've got less market participants uh, and uh, le less um, counterparties, uh, less need to do reconciliations and faster settlements. So for bigger market participants, the prudential requirements are far less as well. Uh, if you think about wholesale electricity markets, it's 60 to 90 days settlement. Right. And so they have enormous capital requirements to run their businesses in that intervening period. And for mums and dads that are invested in solar that want to sell their surplus electricity, it means that they can attract uh, the, the, the income uh, faster than they would otherwise. Right. Really interesting, because there's obviously a lot of parallels with the financial services industry uh, yeah. here. Um, but while I think within financial services, there's a lot of experimentation going on, actually getting to commercialization and production for a range of reasons is, has been more of a challenge. So how, with Powder Ledger, did you get from I guess, proof of concept into commercialisation and a production deployment of the technology? Well, we are, for the peer-to-peer -peer trading across networks, we've done a trial in Auckland in New Zealand, and we're currently doing one with Origin Energy, who's obviously the largest energy retailer in Australia. That, I wouldn't say that we are at the commercial deployment for that product. I think that we're deploying the prototype in different market environments and different regulatory settings. In terms of peer-to-peer -peer trading within buildings, we have deployed that in two apartment buildings and it is live in Fremantle. So that's probably more advanced than the, the, the first product. And then the, the fractionalised ownership product, which we call asset germination, we are at the moment choosing the first site that we will be deploying that on. So you know, we formed the company in May of last year, we're 18 months old, and we have done quite a lot in that period of time, but we, we're yet to transform the market. <laughs> So what advice would you give to um, others, perhaps in financial services industries or any industries who are looking to deploy the blockchain technologies into a new business model, disrupt a market, 
what advice would you give them to think through based upon the journey that you've been on? Well, I think large incumbent players will tend to want to own, uh, the, you know, develop proprietary technology, but the actual philosophical intent behind the blockchain runs is countercultural to that. Mm. And the, the reason that the blockchain is so successful is it's a, it's a distributed ledger and um, that means that you have a vast array of uh, market participants uh, that don't know each other. And, and if I think with private permission blockchains, there may be a market for them, but they may in fact be disrupted by something that is more distributed. And so it, it may be a challenge for, for incumbents to get their head around how the, the culture of um, the blockchain sector works. Absolutely. So how have you managed to approach that with some of the incumbents in the energy industry? You, imagine, you, you mentioned you're talking with Origin. Yes. Well, I think energy is quite interesting because you've got networks which are regulated monopolies essentially, yeah. and then you've got a lot of retailers. The network businesses love the idea of the blockchain because their business model is around maximising utilisation of the asset. And if cons customers consume their electricity, the electricity doesn't touch the network and they don't get paid. Whereas if you see the grid as a trading platform and you transa um, encourage transacting across it, yeah. th then you increase the utilisation of the network and therefore its value. So network businesses get the opportunity of the blockchain and, and uh, by the most part very interested in, in using it. In terms of retailers, at first glance they might be nervous about the blockchain because it's essentially a disintermediation technology, mm -hmm. but it's a regulated environment and uh, you know, they're an essential element of that. And actually, the retailers spend a lot of money on customer acquisition and retention. There's about 30% churn in the retail electricity market each year. And if they can offer their customers like solar and batteries with no money up front, where there is a you know, um, revenue sharing arrangement from peer to peer, uh, then they're more likely to have uh, an enduring relationship with their customers and they're less likely to switch. And it's for that reason, them having a, a product, a customer focused product that they're interested in, in using the blockchain. Great, thank you. And as you look forward in, into the future of the business, the business model, what other sort of digital technologies are you monitoring or do you think have potential to add more value into the ecosystem? into your business model? Well, I think that anything that helps the customer to uh, take control of their electricity consumption or uh, you know, understand that the market opportunities, at the moment we're selling electricity back for a feed-in tariff you know, at a specific rate, but as batteries become cost competitive and reach parity with grid-based electricity pricing, which is happening right now, then uh, con customers can sell electricity in the peak and attract a higher return or provide ancillary services or frequency controls. So there's many other you know, aspects of the electricity market that they could participate in. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're all going to become, you know, um, you know, gamifying the system. Most of them will want to set and forget. Mm -hmm. But to know that, that they're attracting the return that it deserves at that moment in time in the day, I think that that's something that they do want to be closer to. And so information that can be delivered to the customer which, which demonstrates that I think will be attractive. And similarly with banking services, it's very similar. You know, rightly or wrongly, customers feel like their banks are perhaps, uh, you know, not um, giving them the best deal. And that if they can offer a product or a service to customers which demonstrates that they have the customer in mind, I think that it's very endearing. Mm -hmm. Great. No, thank you. Well, that might lead to my uh, last question in terms of broad question. You know, how do you think blockchain could shape the future of money or, or currencies um, more broadly in financial services? It's a great question. So um, I worked in investment banking for yep. 11 years. Yep. I spent nine years at JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. And my former boss, Jamie Dimon, has spent quite a lot of time talking about the blockchain lately. And uh, he made some comments recently which really pushed the market price of the Bitcoin down. Uh, and then he made some more comments and that pushed it down as well. And then, then we saw shortly some traders within JP Morgan were buying up Bitcoin at a bargain basement price. Uh, you know, in, in traditional financial market terms, that would be called market manipulation. Absolutely. But uh, because it's not um, financial services, I think he's just said that if, you, if any of his employees trade Bitcoin, they'll lose their jobs. I just think that it, it's because it's so distributed, it's just not something that you can control. It's unwieldy. 
Uh, and the, in terms of its potential, I think it's enormous. If you can send money you know, overseas now with virtually no transaction costs and, you know, and getting a, you know, a, a fair exchange rate, that's going to profoundly change the way human beings interact with each other, and it already is. You know, the market cap of, of you know, the Bitcoin, I think, is uh, you know, around a couple of hundred billion dollars now. So it's not huge in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, cars weren't when horses and carts were around. So, you know, things, if you look at the growth rate in it, it's quite astonishing. And if you're looking at how it's popping up with ATM machines and uh, Bitcoin credit cards and, you know, there's many cafes that you can pay using cryptocurrency and it's happening very, very fast. And I think the growth rate is more interesting than the actual um, absolute number right now. So, I mean, it's very hard to predict exactly what it's going to happen, but I think it's safe to say that it will not feel like finance as usual. Absolutely. Gemma, thank you. My really pleasure. insightful perspective. Before I let you go, I want to ask if there's any other questions for Gemma out in the audience. Um, feel free, you'll get a microphone. I think we've got one over here. Uh, thank you, Gemma. My name is C. I'm from insurance industry, basically, but have an interest in the project. Um, just wanted to ask, so you already talked about the time which uh, takes now to uh, get something for your electricity produced by solar. Uh, so do you see this um, as a competitive, well, as a main competitive advantage uh, compared to the current model? Or um, do you see it moving forward with the economy of scale that's uh, basically using a whole ledger and uh, selling peer-to-peer -peer electricity will be just basically more profitable for regular shows or what's the other cost of that? Yeah, I mean, our, our energy system has remained relatively unchanged for the better part of a century. We've had large power stations, transmission lines, distribution lines, bringing electricity to people's homes and businesses. But in the past decade, you know, a new system has begun to emerge characterised by citizen utilities, citizen power stations. You know, tw a quarter of Australian households have rooftop solar. And the next stage of that will be commercial buildings putting in solar and batteries. So we're moving from this centralised to a hybridised, distributed and centralised system. And the way that electricity is transacted in that new system will be characterised by you know, different, th different technologies. And I think it's entirely conceivable that it could, it could be you know, predominantly distributed in energy markets with a differential power coming from centralised sources. I mean, when you move from one system to another system, you do have disruption and sometimes supply interruption. And I think enabling technologies like the blockchain could help with a more orderly transition. Any other questions for Gemma? We've got one more. Just on your point um, <clears throat> uh, about the, the, the growth of, of, sol of rooftop solar in particular, do you think that um, given the, that the infrastructure is geared around uh, you know, down, down the speeding from the power station to the end user and there's limitations as to what can be fed back into the grid, do you see that as, as something that will um, limit, I suppose, the electricity market, you know, is in need of reform and is undergoing that right now. The Finkel review, you know, made uh, 50 recommendations, 49 of which have been adopted by the government, uh, and then the National Energy Guarantee seeks to respond to the 50th Finkel review. And so there's quite a lot of work underway with the Australian energy market operator, AMO to address that, and I sit as an expert advisor on a panel that's working specifically on that. And I think there's broad recognition that, that there will be, there'll need to be new technologies which will facilitate you know, this new energy paradigm.